I see a great man, but look in the mirror. I see a great man, just look in the mirror. I see a great man. I see a great man. I see a great man. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Athlete Diaries. I'm here with John Antonopoulos. Yep, yeah. you said oh, right. Boom, right. look at yeah, there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he is from California slash Florida. He, uh, his, I've been blessed with his presence and his sister's presence. They have, we've had a great few days. I'm excited, thank you for coming. Yeah, I'm truly humbled. Yeah. yeah, this is about to be a great conversation. I, I truly enjoyed our last, uh, what is it? A little over 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been amazing. you a very Christian guy, very godly man, someone that's going to push me in my faith and help me get closer. So I like being around people like that. Yep, same here. You know, I, I'm big and I don't ever want to be the smartest person in the room. And I most definitely don't ever want to be the most religious person in the room because I nope. can't learn like that. Hey, the best leaders aren't always the, uh, they're never the smartest. I think they teach you that through like things like SEAL teams, all that kind of stuff, any book you read. It's like the best leaders are never the smartest. They just put smart people around them and know how to use them collectively. No, that's me. I'm probably the dumbest. I just <laughs> I just get people around me that yeah. know what they're talking about for sure. So just to get this started, how did you get into baseball? And just let's walk through that journey a little bit. Yeah, so um, how I got into baseball, my biggest thing was um, I actually started when I was about three. And my dad, when he was younger, he always had a passion for it. And his dad had played up to a certain point. Um, I think he was trying to go into college or wanted to go professional. And then my dad was trying to do also the same thing. But the thing was with his story is he grew up with a lot rougher background. Um, it was in a broken home where his parents split apart. And also his dad was really hard on him because his dad was more of like, kind of kept hitting with reality where my dad really wanted to keep going and playing sports. And his dad was like, no, figure it out for yourself. No, figure it out for yourself. And was always really hard on him. Kind of like an old military background. So my dad, you know, in high school, he was just, you know, playing baseball all the time. And anyways, he kind of was chasing the wrong things. And then when as I was growing up, he was always wanting me to like focus on baseball and kind of build my gift. So that was just always where it started was actually a relationship with my dad where I started at literally four years old. And now, yeah, I just turned 27. So I've just been playing all these years and I've just always had a passion for not really what the game brought me, like result-wise, just the joy it brought to me when I would play it. And I felt like I was home there because I tried to do other sports and it never felt right. But baseball was always a thing where I went in and I felt like this was my calling, this was a gift. So from the age of four, I always told people, when I was at school, they always thought like, oh, that's cute. Like I always say, I want to be a, a professional baseball player. I want to be a you know, major league baseball player, like, like you know, famous, I would always say. Right. So that was always my dream. And I never just want to kill that dream. So from now, the way I'm playing baseball also is also to be an inspiration to other kids where you know, age with sports comes as a factor. You know all these different things and people are going to doubt you but i've always just used it as it's just been such a driving force and why i'm so passionate why i keep getting up every day why i like to put my best foot forward whether it's like fitness training like pushing myself and it's such a challenge is i think why i love it because it's like you're never going to be perfect in it and it's like always striving for that perfection you know call me crazy but it's like that's just always a beautiful thing is always striving for that you know? No, I'm happy you said that because one of the arguments I have a lot lately is people be like, perfection is not attainable, so why would I chase it? And it's kind of like, well, I understand that it's not attainable, but if you chase perfection, you're going to end up somewhere close to it. 100%. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I, it is inspiring to see you continue to chase your dream regardless of the scenarios that you feel you're going through and the, and the process that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I heard you use the term um, independent baseball earlier. Yeah. Can you explain that to me? So, yeah, it's hard to explain to people. I just say, you know, professional baseball player. But basically how it works is independent leagues even started from, like, the, I believe the 90s. or It was even before that, obviously. They even have documentaries on it. There was, like, this team called the Battered Bastards of Baseball. That was, like, the first independent thing. This is from years ago. But where independent ball kind of started was it's mainly um, – it's not affiliated. So when you think of affiliated, you think, okay, so say, for example, the Marlins – our major league team and they have a minor league system from rookie ball through low A, high A, double A, triple A, and then you got the big leagues. So it's like that's when they, when you're a major leaguer, you have the minor league organizations, that's affiliated ball. So you're with a team, whether I'm like, hey, I'm with the Cardinals in double A or I'm with this team or that team. Independent ball is literally what it is. It's it's independent from those major league organizations, but it's still professional. So you get paid the same as minor leaguers, which is obviously terrible, but it's it's essentially the same thing as the minor leagues, except you're not affiliated. 
So that's what independent ball is. So like. So that doesn't mean. Yeah. So when is your off season or when is your in season? So how does in season? It, it's like it's it's almost like a shortened season of how they do a lot of minor league seasons. So okay. For example, a major league spring training starts in February. Like, and the catchers show up say like late January. Like they'll show up really early. For example, right? Um, for major league spring training because they have a way longer season. Usually for minor league teams, even if they can even do a short season like single A season, there's different things they have, but. Uh, for say a normal minor league team, they'll start around even more in like middle of April or May. Like they start way later basically than um, any of the major league teams do. So like minor league spring training is like a few, another month or two past what the major league one is. So when the major league starts up, the minor leagues usually start a couple months later and that's how kind of independent ball is. Okay. Where it starts and it's more of a shortened season where you'll still play about 120, 100, 120 games, but it's not as much as like a major league season. So yeah, that's how it works. It's like you start earlier and then they, they works just like a minor league system where like affiliated guys and non-affiliated guys are always like switching in and out all the time. So that's interesting. So how do you how do you get into that? Like you know what I'm saying? Like how does how does one <laughs> come about getting it, into that? It's literally a lot of the scouts, so say if they're watching the college, um, they kinda it's almost like a recruiting process. Like if you're looking from a college perspective, like going from high school to college. So if these scouts are looking at you and they're interested. Um, a lot of times, say if you put up great numbers and there's still guys in college where even though you did well, they didn't get drafted anywhere or signed to any like major league team. So what happens is like, you know, maybe an independent ball club will call them up because they have, the coaches have connections to get them still in the professional ball. And so you can connect that way. For me, it was like just trying to, you know, again, network through people. So the biggest thing is building relationships and the more you know, you can get in front of them in scout days or different things like that where you're trying to get in front of scouts. You're literally just trying to showcase yourself and also um, even just get even to, uh, sometimes even have like kind of showcase things like in front of them or a scout day, they call it. And I've been to a couple of those. So it's just a way to get on somebody's radar. And then when people get to talking, you know, say uh, if somebody goes, oh, hey, a catcher just got injured and I would, I would be a guy to fill in. So they'd go, oh, hey, I got this guy. He's ready. Like if you need a guy. And that's actually what was my first experience of getting an independent ball is there's a whole other league that's even lower than that. But like getting into actual independent ball where you're actually getting paid is I had to, the kid got injured and he was from the Mets, I believe organization. And when he got injured, uh, he called my coach from college and he was like, Hey, I really need some help. Like I need to get a catcher. And, um, he, my coach, Keith Lytle, he knew I was the only one still playing and he called me right away. And I had to literally drive up from California all the way to Sioux city, Iowa, right away like that and get there by Monday. And, um, yeah, and I basically played there for a month, and I got to meet guys where it, it's just baseball is such a small role too. It's so weird people don't realize so they hear independent ball, and it's like obviously not glorious. But I was literally playing against one of the games, American Association. So there's four levels in independent ball. It goes um, the Pioneer League, which is like a lower league, so it's equivalent to like a rookie ball, low A, and then you have Frontier League, which is like again single A or a high A ball. Um, but you have some double A guys, but American Association is like that solidified double A, and you got some a lot of triple A, double A guys there. And then Atlantic League is the top, and Atlantic League is a lot of um, like actually solidified, you know, major leaguers or triple A guys, where they had like years of service time in the big leagues, and then they're back into the you know independent ball because they got released. So I was actually playing against um, it was Pete Cosma and uh, another guy Matt Adams, and they were literally in the World Series with the Cardinals when I'd watch them in like 2012. In like 2011 when they were playing against the Giants. And then like I'm literally catching in the game, I'm catching this AAA guy we just got who was released. And then he walks up and he goes like, oh, what's up? And it's like weird because baseball is such a small world. Like this guy was literally at the top of his game in the World Series. Yeah. And then now he's an independent ball in American Association. Yeah. So it's just like, it's yeah, also it's bizarre weird. like yeah. stepping into it and you're getting with these guys. You like kind of step back and a guy, Hector Sanchez, a catcher used to watch for the Giants. I'm like, he would be so cool to me. And he was playing with the Texas, uh, this team, the Railroaders. Yeah. And it was just weird because it's like these guys went from like the big leagues like a lot for a while and now they're in an independent ball. So yeah, it can be crazy. that quick. It's like. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Not on so. the top for too long. No, no. Like they just, they don't have a lot of grace with that. And that's the thing is it helps them because they have a lot of room for failure. How baseball works is like there's a lot of business. So if I had affiliate experience, say, and I was coming from a single A, double A organization, and say I was with the Nationals, I got released. Well, that is like a name for me. Like it's kind of stamped on my name where it's like at least I have a pedigree. So when I go somewhere, yeah, you must I, I, I have more of a chance to get bought back because yeah. I was actually recruited or like people knew me. I'm in a system. But like me, when I'm coming from NAIA, 
a school from an NAI, I had to walk onto an NAI and go to this Pecos League where I had to pay for my living. And my parents spent thousands of dollars just to help me keep playing like tens of thousands of dollars. And I had to sleep in my truck some nights. I had to drive across like six hours to a game, six hours back, all this kind of stuff. Um, when I started in this Pecos League, this independent ball, it's like, you know, a lot of these guys aren't willing to go through that, but they don't realize like when you're not at the top of your game, like these D1 athletes, and then you get recruited and say you're in an organization, it's like, I don't have that same luxury in a sense to be like, okay, well, I wasn't scouted out of college. So now it's like, you really have to fight your way through that. And like through like the worst of the worst, like I was in some bad towns, like one of the towns I was in was Colorado and it was uh, like the highest like heroin city in the United States, something crazy. Like there's some places you go and it's like middle of nowhere, but like, it's just been the grind. That's how independent ball is. It's like, when I was doing that, now you're not getting paid at all. So it wasn't really professional ball until I really got to the American Association where now I'm playing with dudes that were all, it was literally a, our whole um, starting staff or almost all of them were all released from AAA from the Mets. So then it's like, you go from that to like dudes that were just there and all they need is one little thing to get right back, you know? So it's like, uh, it's a very interesting experience. So the business part of it, like, you know, when you don't have that stamp on your name, it's really hard to, them to want to take a chance on you, if that makes sense. Sure. Like they'll get rid of you really quick. Cause yeah. they're like, do you, I have two games played. Even if I went like two for eight, oh, see ya. We don't want you. It's like out. Cause you know, yeah, I wasn't crazy. with anybody. So yeah. No, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know baseball had all those kind of leagues and stuff. I know. Yeah. I was going to ask you cause I know football, you can go overseas and stuff. So is that an option for you? Baseball is. And I want to look to that cause it's like the way independent ball is, I don't want to make excuses either. It'd be like the pity story, like victim thing. But the thing is, is like when people are telling you, like when coaches say you got to work hard, see your work ethic, you got to be durable. You got to be this, you got to be that. And then you feel like you're doing all of those things. And I earned a spot saying spring training. And then you get on a team, but then I'll sit there out of 14 games. I only played once. And the last game he was starting me, he was already releasing me. Yeah. So like you say, for example, I'm there for 14 games. I earned a spot to get on the team. Right. I showed out a strong arm, a ton of power. They're telling me catchers don't have to hit because you're a catcher. You got to control the game. You only have to like a buck, like really low. And I was two for six. So that's 333. But then they're just like, yeah, we got to make room on the roster. We're going to release you. And it's like, yeah, you know, you see where that comes. So when people are telling you one thing, but then it doesn't matter what I do, how well I do, I'm still getting like released or getting rid of. Uh, it's that that's where it started changing for me. Where I'm like, okay, you know what? Some of this, you know, maybe it's like a thing for me where I have to maybe venture out somewhere else or God has another plan for me to go, like you said, overseas or place somewhere else where I can get connected. Because that's kind of where I'm at right now is just trying to step out in faith and not and it's actually elite. I don't really don't want to go back to it. I'm just trying to find maybe a new avenue of what I got to do. So that's kind of been where I'm at right now. Understand that. Yeah, I understand that. I'm kind of interested in this whole sleeping in your car thing. Yeah. So how did that come about? Well, it came about so like obviously sitting in the truck because I would uh <laughs> so when I was doing a drive like say from uh, California all the way to um, there's all the parts of my testimony now, but from California, say to Sioux City, Iowa, for example, like when I'm stopping and I start falling asleep cause I'm driving by myself yeah. and there'd be times I'd have my truck packed to the brim or like a mat, like maybe bins have to be strapped down on the outside, the tarps ripping. Cause I'm going through certain like States, you know, and like the weather's really bad. Um, yeah, there was even a time I think I was going through Nebraska or somewhere and it's freezing in the winter and I had to shut off my truck cause I was so tired. And so I would sleep for like three, four hours in the back of my truck and sit down and then I'd wake up. And, you know, stuff's kind of frozen over and then I'd have to start the truck back up and keep going. So it was just stuff like that because of traveling. And then sometimes I needed to sleep. Yeah. I got to literally see my truck where there was one time where they didn't even have a room for us to stay when I was in that Pecos League. So I literally had to sleep in my truck because the truck that was in there was like termites and different stuff in there too. So I literally had to sleep in my truck overnight and get up and then play like a double header the next day. So it was just stuff like that where I really had to fight and trust the Lord. Like, what am I doing? Oh, yeah. I'm sure you had all kinds of arguments like that with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And then you're hard on yourself because then you feel like you're in a situation where I need to do really well. So then when the results start to be a factor, then it actually with baseball, the mentality, that's where it messes you up because then it limits your performance. So then it's just like I'm not in a place where it's being conducive, like an environment where I'm getting better, but I'm also beating myself up. And if I have one little mistake because I don't want to get stuck here and when you're stuck there, it's like a repetitive cycle. And it almost feels like it, it like kind of swallows you and you have to really check yourself mentally that it doesn't like take over your mind state or like you kind of can easily give up in those moments or, you know, you just quit everything because it's like so terrible. 
But it's like that's where I think the Lord wanted to really show me resilience. Oh yeah, that's yeah. important. Yeah, resilience is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So, what is exactly your next step, or what are you exactly doing now? Uh, right now, I was showing a little bit of it, but I'm actually so the Lord was calling us to, like I said, with Independent Ball, I was in the American Association. I was there for a month. Um, didn't hit how I wanted to, but I, I loved the opportunity I got like to catch and actually like have my moments of like, I got my first professional home run there. I had a couple multi-hit games. Uh, believe it or not, people don't think I'm fast. I had two triples. So I was excited about that. Right. Yeah, in the month I played, I played about like 19 games or less. And, um, in that time though, I got to learn a lot. Um, and then also then I was released. Um, I wasn't even there for a month. And then by August, uh, this was in June, I was released or the end of May. Or no, no, I'm trying to think. No, end of June, I was released. And I was in August. I had to go to this team, the Evansville Otters. Same thing. He left me in there. Let me start for a game, two games. We won one of the games. Lost the other one by like a run or something like that. And then he just sat me on the bench. So he brought me over and I sat on the bench and he put me on the injured list. So this is, I also learned about the business. I didn't know they do this. So they'll bring you over and say, oh, I need to fill a need. I, gotta, I need a catcher. And then bring him over because they're going into playoffs. He was putting me in the bullpen and he put me on the injured list. And so he could just, he couldn't reactivate me, which he didn't tell me until after he did that. And I asked him what's up, like, why well, am I not playing? Yeah. And so then I had to just sit on the injured list the whole rest of the year and not get to play when I was never injured. And so he can bring up other guys and let other guys play and he never let me play. So I thought, so this is my thing was like with all these things now, I'm trying to put myself in a place where um, this has been happening to me. So I'm trying to put myself like I'm going to this facility, Cressy Performance, Sports Performance, and there's a lot of professionals there. Like a lot of like big leaguers that come in the off season. So I thought, well, hey, now that I'm around these people and I can connect, maybe this is a way where somebody can see me. All it takes is one person. Even if there's 30 scouts out there and then like 29 of them think I suck. I just need one that would believe in me. So I thought, again, the thing we talked about earlier about like excuses, I thought, well, this is the best opportunity. Even if I have to pay each month to do this, like I might as well refine my skills here, keep getting better, Right, and keep putting myself in the right places with the right opportunities, surrounding myself with the right people. Again, that environment's important to know that, okay, if somebody sees something in me, like I have a chance, I'm right there. Like I can just give myself, put myself in the best opportunity, at least to say I tried or I tried yeah. to do it. You know what I mean? No way. So, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing you guys keep saying you try because you don't want to get to a point eight years from now or five years from now and being like, I didn't try everything yeah. to make this happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Everything to make this happen. And one of my favorite sayings that my old uh, at travel ball basketball coach used to say, he would say, we had this kid, right? He was a crazy scorer. He was supposed to be the you lead our team, whatever. And he would start, uh, I don't know how to explain it. He would just start second guessing himself or trying to not do enough. But my coach would look at him and be like, hey man, any means necessary. Like you're the scorer on the team. So by any means necessary, it doesn't matter how I don't care the ball goes in your hoop. And I kind of, I kind of took that to like my business and just when I was playing football and, and yeah. back to the no excuses thing. So like whenever I set my mind to something, it's by any means necessary. Yeah. So like I don't, I don't have a fear of, so like even with business, so like I don't have a fear of losing a few hundred dollars here and there. If I can see the big picture of like, well, I'm building this relationship, mm -hmm. I'm building this mm -hmm. relationship. Uh, this is going to bring me into this scenario. You know what I'm saying? By any means necessary. And it's just kind of like a mentality that you got to take with you. 100%. And I think that uh, obviously you kind of have that. You got to have that to keep doing what you're doing. Because you're what, 27? Yeah, 27. Just turned 27 in July. So. Yeah, that's, yeah. You got to have resilience and by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Do you ever have a idea or like a date or like a plan where you might be like, all right, this is enough? Um, no, I think, I think in the sense, if I try to think about that, you know, and I, when I'm talking to Jesus and thinking about those things, and then I realize that I think it's one thing to have a routine and structure in each and every day of say how I go about my business in a now perspective, but at least I'm focusing on now. The, plan, the thing I've thought of is like, whenever I have a plan, or I try to plan it out futures ahead. I even used to do a baseball in my head thinking like, I'm going to do this, then do this and I have to play here to do this and get drafted to that. And it's like, that's not how it happened at all, obviously by my story. So I've learned that it's actually built me so much more the way I've also gone through it and knowing that if I have to stick it out or do I, if, say I do get a moment in a year where I'm like, you know what it looks like right when I'm about to give up or I'm like, maybe that's it for me. All of a sudden something comes. 
So it's like I'm always trusting in the Lord that he's leading me on this path for like a purpose. And so right now, me creating even the social media content in the meantime, people think I'm like just trying to be an influencer. It's like, no. It's like if you think about really influencing people and, you know, in the Lord Jesus, it's about how I go about it, not just in what I say, but what I do. So it's been a reflection of like, I have to hold myself accountable every time I see myself on YouTube, on Instagram. It's like, okay, am I going about like posting that? Like, what, how am I portraying myself? Not to be fake, but to like keep myself accountable. And it's like, if somebody else is looking at that, and that was the only chance to hear about Jesus and get saved, it's like, then what am I doing? Right. Like, how am I revaluing my time or am I wasting my time? Am I wasting other people's time? So it's more about like, right now, what can I give? And I feel like I've always had that heart in baseball is again, another reason I love it is because I feel even if teammates or people said bad things about me or they'd say stuff behind the scenes that they didn't know I knew, I would always go up to them and I'd always just um, feel the Lord, you know, would always put on my heart, like just to say like, hey, keep going, man. And I'd always encourage them. So no matter how many times they rebuked me or they said things about me, I always wanted to bless them. So I think that's just my big thing too with baseball is I'm trying to navigate this space to where how can I continue to teach even young men that go through a lot to uh, have them keep valuing themselves and everything they're worth in Christ. And it's like continuing to like walk in that humility and knowing that like consider it pure joy when you go through these things to keep being an example to somebody else that may need you, you know? So that's kind of where I'm at right now with it. It's fun. You keep having this, uh, you give me the example talk. I feel like that's what keeps popping up these yeah. last few days. No, for sure. That's the biggest thing. We need a lot more of that. And like I said, it's admirable that you're doing it for sure to be in that example. Yeah. Like even for me, for sure, I, I've, uh, I can say that in the time that I've met you, it's made me want to be more, I guess, disciplined in a lot of, in a few areas, right, that I, that I feel like I'm kind of slacking on, on, missing on, so I most yeah. definitely got to be appreciative of that for sure. Yeah. Um, so the question that I ask everybody, I asked you beforehand, uh, what is the hardest thing that you've been through in your life, and like, what did you do to get through that and just that journey? Um, I would say it, it led up from somewhere. So I guess I'll share part of my testimony. The hardest thing I went through was, uh, we might as well just say the whole thing. I might as well. Yeah. So, so starting in, um, obviously everybody's favorite time is little league, right? Like you have a time where you get to play with your friends. Everything's great when you're doing well. I go, of course, I've had that experience even as a young kid is like kind of everybody loves you moment. Like when you're doing well, like I remember I was in my little league at home runs, right? So all the kids on my team would like make jokes like in a funny way or like in a nice way to like be like oh john you're so good like all this stuff and i remember that's all i was used to and then right as i started getting older and i started getting into these travel ball games and i started getting into um even going into high school like when i was 14 when i was going to my freshman year that's when i really started suffering from the the persecution being made fun of being picked on um totally out of being outcasted and uh, that was a thing of i didn't even try to do that on my own I was just being the man I felt like my parents raised me to be or how Christ wanted me to be in those moments, whether I even realized it or not. But even just like, I guess, walking and being so graceful to other guys and just being so uh, genuine about my passion for the game, like playing baseball. And I realized in high school, it was a different world, man, where I had a negative experience where people might say they had a great experience in high school. I had a terrible, I uh, even starting my freshman year, I used to play. And no matter how hard I worked, I was always trying to prove my work to somebody. Because no matter how hard I worked, I had my own starting pitchers. I would say, oh, you suck. You're terrible. Guys would uh, mimic me how I'd catch and make fun and laugh at me. And they didn't want me to catch. We're like, we don't even know why you're starting. You suck. Um, every All the time, no matter what practice it was, they always told me I suck. Every time I went to go do something, made fun of me. Um, and that continued through high school. Like, guys that didn't even play the catcher position, like, I would catch way better than you. You're terrible. And always would put me down every day. They used to put, um, like, you know, piss bottles in my locker room. They used to... Um, say things about me to my about my sisters they would say man if those were my sisters i'd be banging them and say actually like nasty crude stuff too to me all the time and um you live in california yeah okay. yeah right. the Bay Area. so even like right even before that going from middle school that transition i even had kids where a couple of them would gang up and i never felt in my heart to retaliate because my dad always told me stories about himself he used to fight all the time like an angry guy so anytime somebody would say something about him, like your glasses my dad boom pop everybody knock people out break their teeth you know, he always get in fights where he's always getting like suspended or expelled. And I just never felt that in my heart. I always just heard the Lord without me realizing it. Like, hey, just don't, don't retaliate. That's not who you are. So like a kid one time like shoved me in the wall and I came home and I had all these scratches and like bruises on my arm, you know, and things of like, you know, kids, 
whether it was verbal stuff they were saying to me, making fun of me, or like then when I, like I said, getting into high school, I would deal with that on a constant basis all the time. So I used to uh, go eat lunch in my teacher's classroom all the time with uh, one or two of my other friends that used to get picked on a ton too, because they were twins. But they were like, uh, what are they, like a uh, paternal twin or I forget how they call them. Maternal. Yeah, paternal twins, but they don't obviously look the same. And so uh, that was the thing. They'd always like just make fun of those kids too. So I always had those friends from a young age. So we would just sit in the classroom and hang out because we didn't have anybody else to go out to out there. Because they'd all make fun of me and hate me and uh, mock me because even I didn't go out and party. I didn't drink. I didn't do any of that. Um, so I suffered, you know, a lot of, you know, persecution in those ways of like kids just making fun of me for no reason. They hated me. And then well, I wouldn't say no reason. Yeah. I wouldn't say yeah. no I, I did this. I kind of suffered the same thing. And I'll say... I can say that even, but even then I kind of understood what it was. It was, and it's kind of what I'm dealing with now. So from a now perspective, so like the last girl that I was dating, mm -hmm. the issue that we had is she felt inadequate and she projected it them on me. So like, I'm big on like, so like if I'm dating somebody like in a relationship, you got to meet me where I'm at. I have routines in my day and I'm not saying that I have the best coping mechanisms, but like I've been through things in my life and I know what works. So like for you to sit there and be sad, depressed, whatever. So obviously I'm not meeting you where you're at. I'm not saying you have to go to the gym with me. I'm not saying you have to read books with me. I'm not saying you have to go for these walks with me. I don't say you have to do all these yeah, things with yeah, me. Yeah. But I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing. But what usually happens is people feel inadequate being around you. The conviction. And so they you feel me, project it on you. And that's when the bullying and the making fun of and the hate comes from. Because you they realize what they aren't when they look at you. And even as kids, they don't realize they're doing it, but that's what it's doing. Yeah. And that's the thing, even receiving it, I didn't understand it either. Like trying to, then you almost get a thing where I, I even would still struggle it, not necessarily to this day, but other in other ways, where even Yana and my sister like um, compliments me in other ways where it's like, no, you got to be more fierce about stuff. But the other things I think I went through a time where you're trying to almost be a people pleaser or find those friends, like somebody's got to find value in me, right? Again, going back to the proving to people, you know, that I'm, I'm worth enough, I'm this, I'm that. And, um, and then you still it, have that? Um, I think in a sense I've, I've really worn off, but I feel like there's other parts of me that I look back on and I've realized like there's probably still a little thing in my life where I really try to almost treat it. It's like a curse that still hangs on. I really want to break off. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well, I think humans naturally yeah. have a desire to want to fit in and kind mm -hmm. of be that kind of person. So I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But I think where it's changed was before when people were like mean to me back, it wasn't like, you know, before it was like, I was so hurt and I'm trying to prove to them. But now I take it as what I've learned from it was instead of doing that, now it's like, oh, they're rebuking me, but I have joy. So it's different the way I see because of my relationship with Christ. So like, I would say the hardest thing I dealt with was when it started was my junior year and I was at that same school and I was at JV the year before and then I went to varsity. And there was this one kid that always said he was like the best kid. He was a good catcher at the school. And so everybody figured, you know, he's going to be the starter. So they do this thing with catchers where it's like they're, it's like they'll have multiple catchers on the team. So like I was one of the backups and like, you know, they give you a whole set of gear and all this stuff. So they set me up with everything. Like I was like, oh, okay, I can make varsity as a junior, right? And so all of a sudden we get to the cuts and I had never experienced it before, but I went up and they call this in this, like um, they have those outdoor classrooms. So I went up to this thing, walked up the little walk, the little ramp. And the coach just looks at me and he goes, Hey Don, you know, I'm sorry, you know, about everything, but he goes like, we're gonna have to like cut you, you know, you just feel like you can go back to JV, blah, 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 all this stuff. And so mm -hmm. when that started, bro, it just, I, I was like so in shock, like an outer body experience yeah. that I, I'd never understood that before that like, cause I've understood it. Like I had the rejection, but not to like, where it was like baseball. I felt like that was my one thing. Like maybe I can excel and have value. And so when that was stripped for me, I was like, wow. And it hit me. I sat there. I was just bawling my eyes out. I went home and I was telling my whole family, like, hey, I got cut, and my parents couldn't believe it, and they felt so terrible. And so from there, that's when we really started. Uh, my dad was already coaching at a private school at the time. It was in Dublin. It's called Valley Christian. So I ended up, uh, you know, not just for the baseball reasons, but it was almost like a breath, like a, like that burden lifted off me. I could get away from those people that were so, like, you know, nasty to me. Yeah, a few birds, one stone. So. Yeah. And so I ended up, you know, in the middle of that school year when we were getting into the, like, the fall semester, I was um, switching from that school. So that private school is actually a D5. This was a D1 technically, it's called E-Ball. So this was like a high level, like competitive school that I was at a public school. Now I was going to a super low division private school. So like not even close, like competition you play consistently. 
um, even though there's still good schools there. And so when I got there, that's when then the school district started saying, oh, we're going to deny you the rest of you to play because this is an athletic transfer. That's why you're transferring out of our school. So I had to go in front of a whole board mm -hmm. and I told them my testimony and all the things I went through. And they still were like, no, we deem this an athletic transfer. Like we're not going to let you play. So they denied me the rest of my junior year of high school to play. So I had to sit out and that's crazy. Yeah, so I didn't even know that was that's a thing. junior year because that's your big year. I don't know how baseball recruiting is. Yeah, but I assume it's close to football and junior. No, it is big. It's pretty important. It's like even with some football players, if you see them at a young age and they already have projectable talent, like you're gonna look at them and be like, okay, what is this kid doing? You know, and that stuff. And it's like it would have been a great for me to like a year of play to even just get more experience. Again, another year of experience, stuff under my belt, learning from coaches, like game like scenarios, all this stuff. But I just not what the Lord had in store for me. And then after that, my senior year, I ended up getting to play. Um, and when I played after that year, then I didn't have anywhere I wanted to go. I literally had to go to a local junior college. Um, when I was going into the fall after my senior year of high school, I was going to my first year of college and I had to, uh, walk on to a junior college mm -hmm. where like, you know, the coach shook my hand he was like, oh, wow, you know, you got a good sized hand. Like just maybe saw some potential in me, but literally, uh, um, that year I just had to red shirt. So I walked on, had to red shirt at that junior college, um, and then the second year, uh, he was splitting time with me and uh, he was having another guy start over me or like getting more of the starting position. And I was kind of having to battle for that and get some playing time in here and there. And actually I had like a kind of a tiff with the coach because he was, I was the guy where I was so insecure at what I went through. I was a very big, I know guy. So he'd say, you gotta do this now. I'm like, I know, I know. And I would always like get really defensive. And mm. that was something I struggled with for a while too, was that defensiveness and, um, Again, more stuff that it's amazing seeing it now because the Lord, you know, Jesus really breaks that off of me and like breaks those burdens off that I don't have to carry that. But at the time, I was just so, uh, yeah, hurt, defensive. I was just like, you know, almost saying like I would listen to you, but I'm not listening to anybody. And so, yeah, I really had to go through that process. And so actually after my second year, after I was there, I was told by um, one of my uncles like, oh, hey, I used to go to Nebraska, University of Nebraska. <laughs> He was like, hey, maybe you can go on there. Like, I know some guys you can get there, get in a situation, and maybe try to walk on to the team, get an opportunity. So I'm thinking, all I thought in my head was D1. And I'm like, oh, cool, like, D1. Like, finally, I can get, like, live my dream because I thought two years out of junior college didn't go because mm -hmm. I was already trying to set it up. And so I tried to do that. Well, my uncle, I didn't know this because the only free living situation, he got me in a frat. And I'm not a frat guy. Again, I've never drank before this, never partied, never done – you know, I, I just was not used to this lifestyle. And so when I got there, you know, I'm telling guys about my faith. I'm like, yeah, I don't drink any of that. Um, by the by the way, not that I'm perfect by any means. At this time, I'm still in the thing where I'm not don't really have a true relationship with Christ. Meaning like even in my the words I was saying, the way I was talking about other people, just kind of like my own hurt from other things would like come out. And like how you try to make fun of people to make your friends laugh kind of thing. And speaking like cussing a lot, all that kind of stuff. And so I get to the Nebraska and I had to go through this whole semester of like, I'm drinking with these guys or going out partying. People are like casting these, like uh, kind of like, I guess in a spiritual sense, like casting stones at me. Like girls were saying stuff about me. Like I was this, I was that, like I'm a weirdo. Guys were saying negative stuff about me. The enemy was just really attacking me. Like my grades were terrible. Like I didn't, I, it was almost like a fog of a, like a semester. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up saying, I got a coach, a uh, call from my coach the one that the, from the junior college that I had a problem with. And um, there was a time when I actually had to go back to him and apologize. And I said, hey, I'm sorry for being an I know guy. I think I know everything. Because coaches would call to ask about me and he would write me off. And he would say, uh, uh, he's uncoachable. He would tell them that. And so the next year when I finally had to leave Nebraska and I was like, I need to go back to ju my junior college and finish out my last year of eligibility. Well, I go back there. And um, he ends up letting me start all the time. He even, we got such a great relationship because I apologized and I admitted my wrongs to him that it completely flipped. So he, my junior college coach went from like uh, degrading me and like telling me like everybody, like he, you can't coach him. I went from that to, um, he was calling scouts for me. Like he got a Marlins scout to come to my game, an Orioles scout. I actually signed a pretty draft form for the Orioles at the time. And I was so shocked. But like, that was a thing where it's like, just by walking in grace and humility, and like really being willing to learn, it can really like open doors for you Thanks. again in your life. And also it shows people your humility and like how you're willing to better yourself and not just be so prideful in like your own thought process. Right. And so that was a big, again, learning point for me 
And then right at that same time, I'm saying this is the hardest part of my life because then I had, that's when I came to my faith, a uh, true relationship with Christ because then when we were getting into the, I was dealing with this, this year, I was dealing with, there was a coach, he was agnostic on the team. He was our hitting coach, he'd help out. And when I was going through my last year at this junior college, before I was trying to find a school to go to, he, one day I was telling a joke and it was from a show and I was like using the Lord's name in vain. And he said, uh, he goes, aren't you a Christian? And I said, yeah. And I was like, and what did you just say? And I repeated the joke and he goes, like, you guys don't make sense to me. And that like hit me hard. And I had to go through a lot of, uh, um, just repentance with the Lord. And I truly like turned my life to truly live for him. Like right after that, like my, the way my language cleaned up, like there was no more cussing, no more desire for any of this stuff. It completely like just kind of got away. Like I just got away from it. Um, through all those times of like all that hurt, pain, thinking I had to go out and drink with friends. Like they would tell me how to have to live my life. And now it was a matter of like, no, I have to be set apart. It was okay that whole time the way I was living, even though people made fun of me, was because I was created to be that way. And it was like coming to that realization with Jesus where it was like, no, he deserves everything. So then right after that, I also went through a little stage of legalism right after that. I was so hard on everything. Like I couldn't even look at people. I had no humor. Like I had no, none of my jokes, none of my humor. I had nothing. I shut down my personality. I shut down everything, shut down everyone. You know, it was very almost like judgmental towards people, like not even realizing it. But I really, that's where was, I think the toughest part of my life was um, going through those things of the persecution and learning how to step, step away from that and like truly let Jesus take over. And like me walk out my faith in him, like you were saying before, is like standing on your faith and like being bold in that. And like, that's okay. And that was the biggest thing for me was knowing that all the years that I was living for Christ and I was doing the things that even the way my parents raised me to honor the Lord. It was like, there was like, that was a beautiful thing. Like, don't be ashamed of that. So now like that was the toughest part I had to deal with in my life was like being okay with being different and like stepping out, like standing apart, you know? So that's kind of my whole toughest mm -hmm. part of my life. Yeah, but yeah. I feel that. I feel yeah. that. That's a lot. Um, that's a lot. That's a big journey. Yeah. That's a big journey. You know, you learn a lot of lessons in there. Mm -hmm. A lot of lessons. So besides humility, what was another thing you learned? Um, humility. I also learned patience. I think the biggest thing for me was patience just because um, only, not even only with other such, not with just a baseball, even with myself. But like I said, I had a legalistic period. So for me, the biggest thing was also patience just for the fact of being gracious to myself to allow myself to grow. And knowing that I wasn't going to figure it out all in one day, like you're not going to understand everything. That's a beautiful thing that it almost breaks you down in humility that people can be self-righteous thinking they know all things like they become God for themselves. And it's like, well, no, the Lord has to be Lord of everything. And I've slowly been walking that more and more out each year to realize like things I can give over to him that I may be trying to take the burden of. So I think that was the biggest thing too is patience and how I was walking with him, but also feeling like I wasn't doing enough of baseball and being patient in his time and when it would happen. Because why I was impatient was thinking, it's supposed to happen this time. I'm out of time. It's supposed to happen the way I said it was supposed to happen. And that's the hard part is like literally, like really letting Christ take over that part of your life and be the one that's like, well, did I say that? And it's like, so if you're truly going to like believe in yourself and walk this out, like I have to trust in his timing and be right. patient in that and not trying to think I have to be here at this time or do this at this time. You know, which I'm trying to explain before even on social media. So that that was the biggest thing too was patience, for sure. Nice. That's kind of um, interesting. So I was talking to somebody. Um, we were talking about patience and mm -hmm. understanding the difference between um, having patience and working in that patience, and patience and saying "What was me?" while you're sitting there waiting, because yeah. as soon as you're sitting there and it doesn't go your way. It doesn't mean the door won't open later down the road, but it's most definitely not going to open if you start playing the woe is me game when it happens. And that's that's what you're helping me with. Like the way you've been talking since I've been here is like there can be even moments of that even where I don't think it. Like I can kind of be woe is me and it's like, you know, be grateful. And like, what are you going to do right. to combat that? Right. Yeah. You got to be you got to be grateful. It's like even though your journey is not going the way that you want it to be, you have to be able to sit there and like wrap your head 
around all the things that you still get to do, mm -hmm. even though you're not doing exactly what you want to do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I agree with that. Like, like, there's 100%. so many things that you're still getting to do that a lot of people on this planet don't get the privilege to do. 100%. You know what I'm saying? So, like, for me, like, like with my mom passing, I look at it as, so, like, people, so I hate, ah, oh man, I hate it. I hate when people will be like, you shouldn't compare scenarios. Because my thing is kind of like, no, like, compare scenarios. So, like, for me, my mom passed away with cancer. There is a lot of worse ways that my mom could have passed away. Yeah. A lot of worse ways. A lot of worse ways for my family. A lot of worse ways for me. I could have been younger, right? My sister's in high school. I could have been in high school, yeah. right? I could have been, I could have been, it could have been something where we were at the house and some guy broke in and they shot her and I had to sit there and see that and it wasn't that. Yeah. But there's yeah. people on this planet that do have that to happened. go through that, yeah. right? So, you have to be able to compare in a sense of in a sense of my life is truly it's truly not that bad like, you know no. what i'm saying like rock bottom it life can always get worse as it is and rock bottom is a bottomless pit and it keeps going and going so you have to decide like all right yes it's not exactly what i wanted Dude, like yeah. for me like my my like part of the whole reason i started all of my businesses and all the things so i could buy my mom whatever she wanted all the it houses, do. all the yeah. cars, yeah. all the you can whatever she wanted. And she's not even materialistic like that. But like all that, like putting her in a house with, with gates and just doing everything is what I wanted. Right? I don't get that anymore. But I can't sit here and be like, well, with me, right? Because yeah. I still have I still have kids. I still have my rest of my family. Or right? I got employees now. If I was to stop and, and, and just stop, right? The whole business stopped. Yeah. Right, so I don't have time to play well with me. And at the same time, what I told my siblings instead of my mom's service when it first happened was, we're not the first family to go through this, and we're not going to be the last. Yeah. But we can be the best example 100%. on how to get through a situation like this and show 100%. other people how to get it through but situations like this. So it's the same thing for you. you for me, you're not going to be the first baseball player who has to go through all that. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And you won't be the last. But you can be the great example on how how to get through these situations. Cause I can feel it, brother. You're close to the pressing on that ceiling of it breaking and then it being the doors opening. Whatever the door might be, it might not be exactly the door that you want. Yeah. But it's gonna be a door. And you for me it's coming wow, for you. No, for I receive sure. that. I really appreciate that. Yes, sir. No, you can feel it. You know what I'm saying? The energy when you talk about it and stuff, you can feel it. Yeah. It's coming, but you just gotta keep grinding, keep grinding it out. Yep, and I appreciate that because you hit on the head with the, being grateful is a part of, yeah, people, like you said, they want to be what was me, but not grateful for that, the fact that, yeah, I still get to do these things. I still get to play the people I get to meet, exactly. the way I still get to train, the way I still get to push myself and almost feel like you want to quit. Yeah. Like to that point of like how hard it can be. And I love it. Like I was in the gym and I literally, my legs were so on fire. Like even when I'm doing squats, it's just how I go. It's like I was pushing myself so hard that I had to kind of sit down. And almost the feeling you can't walk anymore, but it's like, I was comparing that, people don't realize, to my spiritual walk with Christ. It's like, if I had to give it everything, and that even like lets me look to myself now to be so grateful that I get to have these things in order to shape myself so I can also show other people that Christ isn't about all of a sudden when I receive Christ or I have a relationship with Jesus, all of a sudden that oh, everything's happy-go-lucky and that's when it's all like the rainbows, you know, like the cliche butterflies and, you know, butterflies and rainbows, but... I'm realizing that it's about you still going through the tribulations and trials, the nasty stuff that nobody else can really face or feel like they can get through. But it's like now, instead of doing it by myself, now I have Jesus. So now I really, I learned how to like walk, look at those situations differently where before I could have been like you were saying, woe is me, or this is way too hard, or I'm depressed versus now it's like, wow, these people are speaking ill against me. Your words coming to pass. You said, you said what you did, you know, in your word, what said they would say about me. Because for your sake, it's coming to pass. Like, I thank you for being such a, a faithful God and a God that's unfailing, right? It's like looking at it from a different perspective where I have joy right. in those things, like you were saying, versus right. like looking at it in a way where it's like, yeah, why did you do this to me? Or you want to blame God? And it's like, actually, that's the thing I learned even from the Bible is the sickness actually doesn't come from God. People don't realize it comes from the devil. So when he puts that in your life and then people say, well, God, why did you create that? It's like, no, no, no. He still gives free will. Yeah. So when the enemy creates those things, it also like puts it in people's lives. So then they either want to choose to accept God or reject Him. Right. You know. So my three, so my three points to that is 
when people don't understand the same making heaven on earth, well, the only reason why we have to make heaven on earth is because we're not in God's world. We're in the devil's yeah. world. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? People don't understand that. And then secondly, I was, oh, I just lost it. When you said, um, damn, I just lost it. You got to believe in you. Oh, man. Who was it? <laughs> First point is it's God's it's not God's world. This is I mean this is the devil's world, right? Right. And then you said a second point. Man, what was it? I just had it. You said CTE from football, bro. <laughs> yep, that's that's that's, that's I, I remember you talking about though. That's that's for real. It'll get to you. Um hold on, so repeat what you said. What I was saying about just the gratefulness. Yeah. Like being grateful and the fact that, you know, uh well actually the devil doesn't um, the devil is the one that creates sickness. People don't realize that. They think infirmities and things come from, what I'm saying is like God creates them or God put that sickness on somebody. Okay, yeah, I'm here. I'm but here. not realizing that the devil is the one that creates sickness, but right. God's the one that heals from that. Right. And people think that it's God that created that. It's like, no, 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 you understand. It's like everything that the God is, the devil opposes. Right. So it's like if you think of any sicknesses, any like leprosy and all that, people are like, oh, the Lord did that. And it's like, no. Like he gave the devil charge over those things because he he does those things, right? And it's like, but God's the one who like heals. He's, he's a healer. healer. He's a redeemer. Yeah, exactly. All right. So I I'm here now. So yeah, my rebuttal to that one was, or my add on to that one was, you know, we're in the devil's world. But when you were talking about suffering, one of my mentors, um, he's uh, he does athletes in action up at my university that I went to, mm -hmm. which is like a Christian. Um, athletic association and we just got together about twice a week and we talked about stuff and he was like our character coach him and I met all the time privately and one of the things that he would say and then and it's crazy because you're gonna you're gonna be like ah I got it because mm -hmm. that's because suffering is inevitable mm -hmm. misery is a choice misery through yeah. that suffering is yeah. a choice yeah that's true you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. and Jesus and God that's how you dispose of the misery through the suffering because the suffering is gonna happen regardless you're going to go through things. You can't become great and not go through things, right? But being miserable while you're going through things, Jesus really baits that. Yeah, there's a reason why there's even trees. Like when you plant to bear, to like grow fruit, it's like it still has to bear through all the seasons. It's not, you know, it's not apt for like, it, it's not exempt from, say, going through winter, going through fall, shedding the leaves, going back through spring and going all through these, you can say trials. Right. And things but it's like that's the thing that if it withstands through the test of time like through these seasons it's like a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces a bad fruit right right and like you can't withstand so that's the biggest thing is when it talks about the fruits of the spirit i have to remember in any situation i can get down on myself where you want to again like be selfish that's why i looked in the sense of like if somebody was going to do those things i put them on to me i'm so grateful because i'm still going to give and it's like so even when i feel like i have nothing left how can i give and i like, keep giving in that way of the fruits of the spirit because even the, but you keep sowing the seed at some point, that seed, when it takes root, it can be 50-fold, 100-fold, right? So that's just the biggest thing is remembering that, too, to be patient, you know? So. Facts. Mm -hmm. Big facts. Yeah. No, that's big facts. Man. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation so far. Yeah, I know. Me, too. For sure. Yeah. It's not. I The God talk happens often on here. Mm -hmm. Like pretty often, but we don't hardly ever get in depth. And one of the, but one of the most in depth ones I had, I was interviewing a good friend of mine. I guess he's more of a older mentor now, but he's not much older than me. But he coaches. Um, he's at uh, D one in New York now. But at the time when him and I recorded our podcast, he was at UMass. And one of the things that he said to me that just stumped me, and like I had to sit there for like a few minutes, you know, yeah. just sit there and really take it. He was like. Have you noticed that uh, spirituality is at an all-time low, but depression and anxiety are at an all-time high? And like when he said it to me, like every like we were in a car recording, and um, Brandon was in the back seat, my boy, I had another friend with me in the back seat, and it just kind of all went silent, and we all just kind of like had to sit there and like wait for a second, like man, like that's actually like a crazy statement to make, but one of the most realest statements yeah. to make, you yeah. know. And you don't really think about it, but then, like we were saying, like, we're in the devil's world. So, like, like I was saying earlier, like, how I think depression is a privilege. And uh, I, I used to saying now that a lot of people aren't depressed, you're just undisciplined. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, and you kind of, once you start kind of realizing, like, how much the devil is actually playing in your head, 
with a lot of these things. And I think it's almost what depression kind of turns into. Like it's the devil. Depression is kind of the snowball effect of you going through something hard mm -hmm. and the devil finding ways to attack your insecurities you yeah. know, or whatever it might be to get you down. So like for me, I know like nowadays, one of the only ways the devil can get to me is by being a parent. Like literally one of the only ways he can get me right now. And that's just because I'm so like, I just want to be the most perfect parent that I can be. So like now he'll, cause I'm not what a lot of parents my age are. And I'm most definitely not what a lot of parents older than me were. Right. So like when I was saying earlier, I'm not doing the third place. He's lucky if he gets a second place trophy, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah. yeah. But like people are like, you're so hard on him. You're so hard on him. You're so hard on him. And that's what the devil eats at me at. He'll be like, man, you're so hard on your son. He's not going to love you. He's going to hate you. He's going to resent you. It's going to be this. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. So like the devil can like really get to me with that. But then I have to stop. Be like, no, nope, no. Nope. I'm raising my son how God wants me to raise my son. I'm raising my son to become the best version of himself. I'm raising my son to be this and being that. And, you know, and it's kind of, I have to go back to, like, everyone always talks about, oh, Quentin's so smart. He's so, he speaks so well. He's so independent. He does this. But then they kind of see me with him. They're like, why are you so hard on him? Why yeah. are you so tough on yeah. him? As, you know? As if there's a way about, like, producing the fruit. That's the funny part is, like, they love the result of it. But then when they see the process and they almost, like, get mad at you. Or, right. oh, now it's, like, you're being too much and all this stuff. But that's the thing is, like, you're coming as a parent. You're like a lion in the den. Even my mom used to tell me that. And at a certain point, yeah, there might be things like you have to work on or be better at as a parent, like they're saying, but at the same time, it's like you're fighting for that kid and you're not going to let even the enemy try to get in his way or other people feed him in his way because if you're not there, well, then somebody else is going to be there for him. Right, exactly. And if you're not there, the enemy's like, oh, I'm a good father too, right? Which is a lie because he's a father of lies. So yeah, it's like, thanks. that's when, you know, when the Lord's not there and these things aren't put in place, you don't have any kind of structure. I think that's when like lawlessness abounds you know, spiritually in somebody's life. So then you just turn to sin. And then exactly. the sin becomes like, when you don't know eternal comfort, you're just used to that temporary. And that's also a thing too. I think like even with your son, what I'm passionate about, even when I have a kid or I want to teach these young kids, I'm really sick and tired of like this whole lust and pornography and all that. Like oh, yeah. it's so, yeah. Um, like people can't admit to sin. Like, oh, they got to let it go. No, because I mean, it's even something that like has made me struggle. And for a long time, many years where I didn't have somebody necessarily telling me like hey you shouldn't be doing that stuff right like this is how you should treat, like be with a woman and see those things and blah 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 rather i had uncles around me that were like oh why don't you get with the girls you know and give her like you know tell me and then he would say all this stuff and like where i wasn't like that in my heart i was like no i don't want to do those things and they'd make fun of me for it so it's like a man i had around me right the enemy was let to run, uh, run rampant he goes oh yeah this is what it is this is what this pleasure is this is what it is right right and i was like i really want to teach these kids like no you're wasting your time these people don't even know you right. on the screen. They don't care about you. No. And if anything, when they're done with their career, these girls try to act like, oh, it's hot. This is great. And then uh, I was miserable. actually listening to a testimony. Yeah, they're all miserable. They're miserable and they yeah. kill themselves. Yeah. And because because no, one, no one takes them seriously. No. It's, you, for me, you can't. Yeah, I have this issue all the time, especially nowadays with the OnlyFans thing. It's kind it of like, yeah, they don't actually make money. as much money as they say they no, do. They don't. No, they don't. No, we're close. No. Like I know a girl, she made fifty dollars and she was in the top like thirty percent performance. See, I told that's why I told my sister, so I was so irritated. Like, see, this gets me fired up because it's like they're taking advantage of the kids, and now when I see my nephews, I'm like, well, if I'm still dealing with an issue, again, it like makes you look at it yourself. Like, I don't want to make excuses. Like, I'm yeah. fighting for those kids. Yeah. I'm fighting for my kid. I'm fighting for my spouse. No, exactly. One thousand. She deserves better. One thousand. You can't just be say I'm a Christian and all of a sudden I'm like struggling with this. Yeah. Which is people don't like to admit it too, and they feel like they're less Christian. But yeah, I struggle with the and still struggle with like the less and like keeping it away out of my life. Because yeah. in the pornography, even if I've been away from it, it'll still want to creep back up. Oh, the yeah. devil's not playing around. So it's like, people, you you got to take this stuff seriously. Like it's literally. Uh, a battleground yeah. for your life yeah. and that's how I see baseball is like somebody's trying to like tell me or take it away from me somebody's trying to take this dream that you got away from you it's like I'm not like I can't let you do like you get so fierce because you're like fighting it for yeah, it yeah exactly no, you know exactly, what I'm saying exactly and it's like what kind of man are you if you're not because right. then you're a coward and you're going to submit to like oh well they said I couldn't do it so here you can yeah. have it no exactly you know yeah no exactly no exactly We're and how embarrassed thing. you know people say embarrassed but how embarrassed you to feel like your dad's like you're telling them all this stuff, and it's like, well, what would you stay committed to? And you're like, well, oh, well, yeah. what are you going to tell them? Right, exactly. No, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, no, so Truly, the porn thing is kind of how I started 
truly being able to pair the spiritual battle that we're in to the political battle. And once you kind of start realizing, like, well, one is you do, like, a history lesson and you kind of understand. Porn is how they've taken down men in history, like, in countries ever. So, like, some of the, the, the play is kind of the, we deliver some kind of porn. Men get distracted with porn. Yeah. And now they're not being as productive. They're not being as whatever. So, like, I most definitely had a sexual addiction, pornographic addiction mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. college when in high school. And, I like, I've beaten it to a pulse at this point and um and it's it's a difference and i wish i could say like i beat it for spiritual reasons but i beat it because i started re like doing i heard someone say uh like your sperm has the ability to build a baby right so like imagine if you don't release all that energy like what it can do for you so like now like my testosterone my energy like me be, like having more energy and all that kind of stuff like it grows and like that yeah. that was kind of my push to kind of do it but then, like, as I was doing that, I was able to start realizing, like, the true spiritual battle that we're in. Because you can look at almost everything that's yep. pushed in our society right now. Oh, yeah. And it's, true. it aids in degeneracy and people not being anti-spiritual. And that's kind of back to what I was saying earlier about spirituality being all-time low and depression being all-time high. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's because they've eliminated spirituality and they started pushing all of this immediate pleasure and desirable things in your face and that's why so many people are miserable even when yeah. you get those things yeah so right? take that mentality into business right if you said like we we're talking about the book actually before for anybody who doesn't know like the book atomic habits but the habit stacking or habit building when you're creating good habits is you when you look at that you're like well not only am I retraining my brain that when my testosterone is up it's like before it's like i made an excuse of like i have to do this so i can feel relieved of this but now it's like, no, now when you're retraining your brain, again, even that, the things that you do with your body, it's also retraining from what other things you do in life. It's like how you're actually building from that, like from the, even that standpoint of like, when I'm withstanding from that, it's also taking a mentality where it's like, now I'm looking to do other things. Like even with your, you know, business, if you made an excuse about that, or just because you didn't see results, because this is the thing with less, right? You try to like stay with Stan for a minute, all of a sudden, three months later, boom, it tries to get back to you again. It's like the business, you don't see a result in one month. And immediately, what are you going to do? Like backtrack on it? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, it's a thing of you have to continually pursue the faith and like put God first. So it's like when Christ is at the center of that, then you're continually growing. And it's like instead of looking at the things where I can have temporary satisfaction, it's like that's the thing is people don't know rejection and don't want to fail. So that's an instant gratification of not built a bad habit, but I've trained my brain to think, oh, this releases me because I don't have rejection. I don't have you know, any worry of social anxiety, I don't have this and all that, whatever society says. And it's like, well, that's the whole problem is like, you're not willing to fail. You're not really being a man because you're not willing to pursue anything and see anything out. So it's like, that's where I've been on, on that kind of kick too with like, even thinking about starting a business, like you inspired me, where it's like, what are you gonna do? Like say three months, even social media, you only have a hundred views a video, but you gotta quit all of a sudden. And that's what I've been telling myself as like a, a, a good way to, to gauge where it's like how if I say I'm about this life and I can do it in baseball, how am I going to carry that in other aspects of my life? So I'm not walking as a hypocrite, but I'm walking in like I'm, I'm about what I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm actually doing the action instead of just saying it. So maybe I should display it and keep my words few and my actions, you know, many in a sense. Fact. Yeah. Fact. And to go back to what you were saying earlier about being that example on the Internet now, like for me. Personally, I know like people are looking at me, so it just motivates me to be better, right? Like where some people would take it kind of like, oh, I can, like people are looking up to me. It's, it's like, nah, but this is humbling mm -hmm. that you would even consider listening to my words, whatever. But now, nah, like I got to make sure 100% my actions match, right? And I got to, and it, it humbles me to make me want to be better, 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 100 better, better, and make sure I'm truly living, living that. I can say I've most definitely... I would say the only thing that I, but I truthfully, I've gotten so much better at this. It's something that I never thought I'd be able to quit with smoking weed. Mm -hmm. And like, I've gotten to the point now, like I can go two months without it, weeks without it. For me, like I just do it socially, like just cause I enjoy it. You for me, I enjoy it with my friends. Like we're kicking it, had a good long day. You for me, we want to roll something or whatever. But like, for me, I used to be four, five blunts yeah. a day. Like just making it wow. through, you know what I'm saying? And now it's kind of like, and it's just kind of crazy how 
once again, like you have this hole in your heart. And when you start filling it with God and Jesus, how easy it is to kick some of that other stuff off. Mm -hmm. You don't have a desire for it anymore. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not missing, you're not feeling like you're missing something and you have to fill it in with something else. All these temporary things that you have to fill it in with. Right. And that goes back to why I started preaching more spiritual instead of political. Yeah. Because yeah, you're, yeah. you're filling God with all these things. You're going to slowly start being like, ah, I don't really want to do that. No, I don't really need to go out and party every week and chase this guy or this girl and do that. No, I don't really need to go drinking and doing all this stuff right here. No, I don't really need to smoke a big blunt every night and, and all day, every day. Right. And like, so like, even when like my mom passed, like I did start smoking again heavy. But then, like, very quickly, it kind of was like, okay, this is not, this is not who you are. This is not. And that, and Atomic Habits, one of the biggest things that, that, um, that I related with, and I thought was crazy was when he said, hey, I see a great man, when I look in the mirror, I see a great man, just look in the mirror, I see a great man, I see a great man, I see a great man.